Failed Utopia, the podcast about utopian ideas and paradise lost. We look at utopian concepts of the past, present, and future, as well as utopian societies and communes, which promise the world to eager followers, but inevitably fail when it all starts to unravel. lovelies. This is Anna, your overly spicy podcast host. In today's episode, we are going to talk about the granddaddy of utopian fails, People's Temple, or as you might know it, Jonestown. Some episodes of this podcast contain disturbing or upsetting topics. Use your discretion for yourself and those around you. This won't be appropriate for kids. If you feel you need support, Please find help through a crisis line, mental health professional, or a friend or family member. I have resources including crisis hotline phone numbers listed in the show notes. The tragedy of Jonestown is so much a part of American lore that it's even embedded in our lexicon in the form of the phrase, drinking the Kool-Aid. This saying usually refers to someone who's so bought into something that they've ceased to recognize the difference between reality and their, air quotes, crazy beliefs. At first blush, this might seem like an accurate characterization of what has extensively been referred to as mass suicide. But as with most things, the truth is a little more complicated than that. How did this agricultural utopian community deep in the dense jungle wilderness of Guiana, South America, become the flashpoint of a tragic mass death that took the lives of 918 souls, including a U.S. congressman? Let's dive in. Imagine life in an idyllic, agricultural commune in the middle of a remote jungle, free to live as you please. You wake up one morning in a racially integrated community of like-minded people. Everyone here is equal, and everyone contributes to and reaps the rewards of shared labor. You work alongside family and friends you love, creating a life free from the greed and corruption of a capitalist society showing the world a shining example of the utopia of socialism. Sound pretty good so far? You follow an animated, charismatic, and loving leader. You call him Dad. Or maybe you believe he's a manifestation of God. He tells you how to live. You work long hours toiling under the hot South American sun, but you don't have enough to eat. You suffer from severe sunburns, skin ulcers, worms, and foot fungus. One night, you wake from a deep sleep to the sound of Dad's voice over the loudspeakers positioned throughout your village. He says that mercenaries are attacking your beloved Jonestown, and they are here to take and torture your children. The only thing you can do is commit revolutionary suicide. You must hurry to the central pavilion to take a drink from the vat of poison. You rush to drink and wait with the others for the poison to take its effect. But wait. Now, Dad tells you there was no poison, and there were no mercenaries at the gates. It was just a loyalty test, one of many. And if you were willing to die, you passed the test. You live another day, but every night when you fall into bed exhausted from a 12-hour day of backbreaking labor, you wonder if the next test might be the last, the final white night.
this was the reality of life at Jonestown. Now, by this point in the story, you might be wondering, why the hell was anyone going along with this? And to that, I pose another question. Who was Jim Jones? And why did he have so much influence over the people of Jonestown? Jim Jones came from humble beginnings. He was born James Warren Jones in rural Indiana on May 13, 1931, to parents James Thurman Jones and Lynetta Putnam Jones, a disabled World War I veteran turned farmer and a housewife, respectively. Calling Lynetta Putnam a simple housewife or farmer's wife is a bit laughable when you realize how ambitious and what a character she really was. However, given her penchant for self-aggrandizing lies about her biography and conflicting accounts given over the years, including in a dictated memoir recorded in Jonestown, it would be pretty hard to even describe her accurately. Jeff Gwynn gives it a shot in his 2018 book, the Road to Jonestown, Jim Jones and People's Temple. And there's quite a bit more information there, but suffice it to say, she was a pretty colorful lady. She'd married three times, she smoked in public, cursed in front of anybody, and thought it was funny when they were shocked, and she even wore pants. This was radical for women at the time. Some of her behavior and beliefs went beyond unconventional to strange, Notably, when, upon becoming pregnant with Jim, she claimed that she'd conceived after a mystic vision that nearly killed her. She later claimed she had given birth to and raised an almost god. If I had to go out on a limb and say which parent Jim ended up taking after, I'd have to say it was mom. His father, James Thurman Jones, grew up unremarkably, perhaps disappointing his Quaker father with his lack of ambition or standing out in any way. His father sent all or almost all of his 13 children to college, but James wasn't interested and instead found work in construction. By the time he was 30, he was unmarried and just getting by, but World War I was in full swing. He enlisted in the military and eventually returned home, disabled and a shell of a man. He suffered from severe respiratory issues due to a gas attack and frequently could barely speak or couldn't speak at all. He deteriorated more and more over time from that point onward. I didn't find much information about how Lynetta and James met or their courtship, But by the time Jim was born, they had met and married and were living in destitution on a failing farm in Crete, Indiana, on land given to them by James's father. Shortly after Jim was born, his father had a mental breakdown, presumably after his physical condition had steadily worsened, combined with the severe stress of extreme poverty. James was hospitalized, leaving Lynetta with the farm and a newborn to contend with. Eventually, James was able to leave the hospital, but he was in no condition to solve the couple's financial problems. The only way they survived when the bank came to take their house was with the help of the extended Jones family. With their assistance, James, Lynetta, and Jim moved off the farm in Crete to a simple house in Lynn, Indiana. The family didn't fit in. Lynetta's unconventional ways and sour demeanor kept people away, but out of respect for the greater Jones family, some of whom were also in Lynn, and for James's war service, they were tolerated. The fact that the family didn't attend church further alienated them from the community, as everyone else in town did attend church. It didn't matter which one, but skipping it all together simply wasn't done. 
When Jim was old enough for school, Lynetta took work at a glass factory. The extended Jones family supported them financially, but expected her to work as soon as Jim was in school to take on as much of the family's costs as possible. Lynetta was extremely bitter toward her in-laws. She believed she'd been born to be a great woman and a wealthy woman, but that her circumstances kept her from her potential. She took a lot of this out on the Jones family and insisted on believing that they hated her, were jealous of her superiority, and wanted to see her fail because of it. Like I said, she was a bitter woman. They really weren't out to get her, but she hated being beholden to them because of her husband's disability and their financial problems. Once she started working, Jim was left to wander the streets of Lynn, as all the boys in town did, riding bikes and playing. The adults kept an eye on all the children, but they were mostly left to play and wander as they pleased. Lynetta took this a step further and forbade Jim from entering their house when she and his father weren't at home. This seems like a strange rule, and with Lynetta at work and James spending his days at the local pool hall, this left Jim to wander the streets for long hours after school. Relatives and other women in town took it upon themselves to invite Jim to their homes and give him something to eat when they saw him forlornly wandering the streets on his own. One of these women was the wife of the Nazarene pastor and an extremely devout woman herself. She took the opportunity while Jim was scarfing down pies in her kitchen to speak to him about the Nazarene faith. Everyone knew his parents didn't take him to church. This was the perfect opportunity to add a wayward soul to the flock. Jim was receptive, and eventually she began taking him with her to Sunday church services. Lynetta didn't care. She was happy to have him out of the house and have some time to herself on her day off from work. Jim took to scripture and sermons like a fish to water. He memorized Bible passages, soaking it all up like a sponge. Soon, his weekly visits to the Nazarene church weren't enough. He started visiting every church in town, sometimes more than one per Sunday, plus revival meetings, which were frequent in the area. He was baptized by multiple churches. He even went up on stage at a Pentecostal church and got saved every Sunday for an entire summer. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the norm is to get saved once and be done with it. His attendance and membership at several different churches was tolerated because it was viewed as the preferable alternative to no church at all, which was the road he had been on, and it was assumed he'd eventually settle on one. He practiced preaching from a stump alone in the woods. He wanted to be a preacher. What led him to this fervent church attendance? At the very least, it must have been a big departure from anything he may have absorbed from his mother. Lynetta was spiritual. She didn't believe in some sky god or heaven and hell. She believed in reincarnation, a belief she would later pass on to her son. Decades later, Jones would say he never even believed in God. It's impossible to know, but one has to wonder— What was it that he found so irresistible about religion? He later claimed he only used the church to infiltrate religious communities so he could then turn them to socialism. He did have a chameleon quality that would have allowed this type of cynical infiltration. After the fact, it seems believable that he was simply a cold calculating manipulator who used his social skills for his own gain. He did display a genuine talent for making people feel as though they had a special connection with him, that they had something in common. As a young boy, he'd befriended the man who ran the local airport after just a chance encounter on the street. He convinced the man that he loved airplanes more than anything 
and that all he desired was to grow up to be a pilot. Impressed with his enthusiasm, the man gave Jim special access at the airport, letting him get up close to the planes and talk to the pilots. He took Jim under his wing because of their mutual passion for airplanes. Did Jim really want to be a pilot? I don't know. Was he just looking for approval from a caring adult because of his unhappy home life? Whatever his true motivation, it's undeniable that Jim did have an ability to ingratiate himself with others, something that certainly came in useful later in his life. Stephen Jones, Jim's future son, would later say of his father that he had the ability to instantly tell what was most important to you and what you feared. The upshot seems to be that Jim Jones, or Jimmy as he was called then, was a somewhat strange child who talked about death a lot. If I went to church and tent revivals as much as he did, I'd probably be thinking about death a lot too. But Jimmy took it a step further. One night, he took a bunch of other kids to a casket warehouse, snuck everyone in, and told them all to lie down in the caskets and think about what it was like to be dead. Something else that gets cited from the backstory of Jim Jones as a big red flag is that he performed elaborate funerals for dead animals. I don't think this is that strange or morbid because we know that he wanted to be a preacher. Getting good at performing funerals would be one of the first things you'd need to do. There's no evidence that he killed animals for the purpose. He just scraped up roadkill and things of that kind for these practice sessions. If he actually did believe in souls and heaven and hell at this time in his life, he may have thought he was doing the creatures some good. There's a lot more information to be had about young Jim's upbringing, but it's largely unremarkable save for his religious fervor and the fact that a lot of people thought he was a little bit strange. Shortly before Jim graduated from high school, he and his mother moved from Lynn to Richmond, the nearest large town abandoning his father, who died not too long after. Post-graduation, Jim was working as an orderly at a hospital where he met a nursing student named Marcelin Baldwin. Despite Marcelin being his elder by a few years, Jim set himself to winning her over, and the two bonded over their mutual desire and talent for helping people, as well as their religiosity. They married in 1949. Marceline came from a well-to-do family in Richmond, and Jim and the family disagreed over their conservative beliefs and his progressive and extremely rigid ones. After their marriage, Jim and Marceline also fell out over similar differences. Jim claimed he didn't believe in a God who would allow the suffering he saw in the world, and Marceline disapproved of his turn towards socialist ideology. For the most part, Marceline compromised, and Jim didn't. Divorce was out of the question for a woman of Marceline's upbringing and beliefs, so she adapted. It was around this time that the utopian ideas Jim would later sell as the People's Temple really started to form and solidify. Throughout the early years of the marriage, Jim was undecided regarding a career path. He took some general college courses and the couple moved to Indianapolis, where Marceline worked at a children's hospital. Jim's interest and involvement in socialism grew as did his attendance at communist talks and events, though the Cold War was on by now. He now showed open disdain for religion. He found Christianity in particular to be hypocritical. But in a plot twist, Jim discovered through Marceline's attendance at a Methodist church that they now had a platform of social activism, fighting poverty, racial integration, and free speech, among other things that appealed to Jim. These were the things he thought the church was not only obligated to preach, but to put into practice. He soon became a Methodist student pastor. It seemed Jim Jones might just become a preacher after all. Around this same time, he resumed his former habit of church hopping, 
This time, he frequented black churches. Jim thrived at the musical, joyous, raucous, and unrestrained services, so different from the staid and strict ones more typical at white churches. He joined in enthusiastically and made friends, and Jim and Marceline started inviting these new friends around to their apartment. Jim almost immediately became frustrated with the Methodists. He was too low on the totem pole. He didn't have any authority. But he soon found an outlet for his ambition in the region's many evangelical tent revivals. He quickly learned from observing the other preachers on the circuit that flamboyant antics and faith healings drew the biggest crowds and tried his hand at the same. He would mingle through the crowd eavesdropping before his turn to preach, and then astonish the crowd with his psychic abilities later on the stage. He even started performing fake faith healings. It was a crass move, just a means to an end. He never believed he could heal anybody. He just knew that's what brought the crowds. What's truly unbelievable about this is despite it all being entirely faked, there were numerous people who really did believe he cured them of their ailments. In spite of the deception, Jim did seem to have some good intentions at heart. He interspersed some talk of racial integration, anti-war sentiment, and socialist philosophy when he preached. Preaching to white Christian audiences about racial equality always lost him some of his audience. Remember, this was the early 1950s, Jim Crow America. Even in the northern city of Indianapolis, blacks faced brutal discrimination and segregation and mainly lived in what amounted to a slum. Soon, Jim's modest role as a student in the small Methodist church couldn't compete with the excitement and freedom of his moonlighting on the revival circuit. He left the Methodists within a year of joining and opened his own small storefront church in the poor, mostly black Indianapolis slum known as Frog Island. He called his new church Community Unity. Catchy. At first, he and Marceline attracted a few congregants by handing out flyers around the neighborhood. But the church slowly grew as Jim gained a reputation for using his Sunday services to personally solve problems for the church's members. These problems were practical things. In one case, he helped an elderly woman get her electricity turned back on. This makes sense when you consider that Jim may not have had nearly as much interest in the afterlife as he did in his goals for solving real-life problems in this life. If what he would later say about his beliefs was true, he may not have even believed in an afterlife. While community unity was growing, Jim continued working the tent meeting circuit, performing his mentalist tricks and fake healings. He was good at it, eventually drawing crowds of thousands and turning away hundreds once the venue filled. He aimed to gain not only notoriety, but also money, which he planned to use to expand community unity and local services for the poor. His small storefront church had now grown to perhaps a 100 members, and he met his goal of having a racially integrated congregation of both blacks and whites. His dedication to the cause seemed to have been genuine. He was offered a job at a large Pentecostal church with a thousand worshipers, but turned it down when his black congregants from Community Unity weren't welcome to follow him to the all-white church. One silver lining was that a few of the white parishioners from the Pentecostal church actually followed Jim to community unity because of the kerfuffle. They were disappointed in their church's rejection of new black members. Community unity continued to grow thanks to Jim's ongoing appearances at revival meetings and the collections that came with them. Jim purchased a new building to house his growing congregation, and with the change of scenery came a change of name, People's Temple. As People's Temple was growing and becoming more established, 
Jim was beginning to gain some influence in the wider community, although this too was something of a deception. Marceline was actually the one who figured out the players, cultivated relationships, and researched community issues. She was the daughter of a city councilman in Richmond, after all. She knew how these things worked. She'd give her husband a crash course, and then when they attended city meetings and events, Jim would be the one to get up and give some very insightful remarks and shrewd suggestions. Soon, he was being recognized as a community leader. He became a political machine, gaining clout and attention by using his congregation to turn out the vote and attend rallies. The more recognition and influence he gained, the more he craved. The couple purchased and ran nursing homes and a restaurant to raise income for People's Temple programs. In 1953, the New York Times reported that Jim imported monkeys and went door to door selling them as pets to raise money for the church. That doesn't sound very progressive to me. Of course, people in the 50s didn't know as much about exotic animal trafficking as we do now, and door to door salesmen were far more common. I guess animal rights wasn't one of Jim Jones' causes, and it's certainly a creative way to raise a few dollars for church. I'm really curious about anyone who bought one of these monkeys from a complete stranger who knocked on their door. If you or anyone you know has ever bought a monkey or any type of exotic pet off a door-to-door salesman, that's a story I would love to hear about. In 1957, Jim's mother Lynetta moved in with the couple, They also decided to add on to their little family. They had already adopted one daughter, and due to Marceline's health issues, they decided to adopt again. That's when they came up with what they referred to as a rainbow family. They would essentially hold themselves out as an example of racial unity. They first thought of adopting a black child, but they weren't sure how to make it happen because it had never been done before in their state. That's right, no white family had ever adopted a black child in Indiana. While they looked into this, they traveled to California and worked with an agency to adopt two Korean orphans, a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Shortly after the adoption, Marceline found out she was in fact pregnant. Things seemed to be looking up for the Jones family, but fate would soon deal them a tragic blow when their adopted daughter, Stephanie, was killed in a car accident. Their grief was only intensified by the fact that because their daughter was Korean, no cemetery in the city would allow her to be buried with whites. They also had to find a black mortician to prepare her body. A few weeks later, Marceline had a son, who they named Stefan. But Marceline couldn't forget Stephanie. She claimed that on the night Stephanie died, she came to her in a dream or a vision and told her that Oboke needs a mommy. The Joneses learned through the California Adoption Agency that Stephanie actually had a sister named Oboki, who was still in an orphanage in Korea. They adopted her and for some reason, they changed her name to Suzanne. It's hard to say if Marceline believed she had this vision, or if it was just a story they told later. I think it's more likely they'd already known about Oboki through the adoption agency, but who knows. In 1961, they did finally adopt a black child, who they named Jim Jones Jr. Jimmy Jr. would later say his father always reminded him of that fact, calling him his adopted black son, not my son. That completed their rainbow family. Many people today probably find that term unsavory or offensive, but that's what they called it. Clearly, Jim Sr. wanted to make a statement. He made a point of positioning himself as the champion of the cause of racial equality and integration, And it seems to me that he was willing to use his family as props in his quest to do so, 
much as he used the trappings of the church as props for his other goals. He continued faking faith healings to draw more converts to People's Temple, which to him were just a means to an end. The idea that the end justified the means was a powerful leitmotif throughout Jones's life, hallmarked by countless cons and deceptions, and became a central tenet of how People's Temple operated. By 1965, Jim felt it was time to make a move. This concludes part one of the story. In part two, we'll talk about moves from Indiana to California and finally South America. When things start to go bad, they really go bad. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts to help other people find it. Tell your friends about it, and if you want to support the pod directly and help keep new episodes coming, you can donate to the show through the link in the show notes. Connect and stay in the loop on the website, failedutopia.com, or the Facebook page at Failed Utopia Pod. Failed Utopia episodes are written and produced by me, Anna Roberts. The burning palm tree painting featured on the cover is by artist Harry Vasquez. My intro music is by Elliot Middleton. See you next time.